Um, uh, Liam was a, um, used to work as a lecturer in Hull University. He also was a part-time lecturer for the Lifelong Learning of York, which I've um, done a few of those courses, so I'll look out for a geology one. And, uh, but also, he has, he uh, was, him and his colleague ran these um, tourist uh, walking tours in York. He's also uh, setting up, he's now left the academic life, but is a freelance paleontologist. So I don't know whether you just go chasing dinosaurs or whatever, um, <laughs> but he's um, doing the, uh, he's setting up, he has a huge amount of following with um, going on various fossil tours, especially in the East Coast. We've, we're really lucky to have um, such an abundance of fossils there. But he's going to tell us, he also goes into schools and teaching, and uh, he's got some, I think, some leaflets tonight which will um, uh, let us know a little bit more about um, some of the things, and I hopefully will um, organise him for another walking tour, because that was just so, uh, such fun. So thank you, and I won't say anything more. Thank you very much. And can I will ask you after take your glasses, save your glasses, so if you're staying for supper, take your glasses and um, refill them during supper. Yeah, well, thank you ever so much for, for inviting me to, to come and uh, speak to you this evening. Uh, as you just heard, yes, I, I kind of got asked to, to, to lead a, a walk and I'm now very aware that there are quite a lot of people in the York area whose ability to go across town has been hampered by me telling them to look at all the building stones <laughs> and all the cobbles. Um, and I get into arguments about whether this is enhancing people's walks or, or hampering them. I like to think it, it's giving people an extra uh, glimpse into a very, very deep history uh, of the city. So what I'm gonna talk to you tonight is about, I guess all the things I'm interested in really. Um, so I'm not a historian, but I, I'm, you know, I'm really interested in particularly history of science, history of paleontology. Um, I'm very interested in, in urban geology and say where you can find interesting rocks and fossils on, on towns and city streets. Um, and then I'm, ultimately my, my background as a researcher is marine paleontology. So York's not really <laughs> fulfilling that, um, that, that need. Um, but actually, as you'll hear, there are some curious ways in which a marine paleontologist such as I am uh, can can find things to study, and and so yeah, the the, the talk that you'll 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 hear this evening is a is a say a splicing of different things. I'm going to talk a, about uh, a group of fossils called crinoids or crinoids, depending on your preference. Uh, a, a gentleman who was a physician in York, Martin Lister, and essentially the role that they both played in the origins of paleontological science, the, the discipline of, of fossil science. And it's something I didn't really know very much about until until COVID came along and I spent a lot more time reading and wandering around York and, and the elements that I'll talk about, many of them kind of came from, from there. So, um, so yes, I'll, I'll, I'll move on. And, and the title hopefully will make sense shortly as to why Venerable Beads, what's that got to do with? Well, it'll all become clear, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, let's see if you can, whoop, bear with me. Let's see if we can move on. Right. So the um, the immediate sort of observation, going back to what I was just saying about about where my recent interests have, have have been, is is the observation that if you walk the cobbled streets of York, in places they appear to be paved with polos. Now, of course, polos are a York creation. They are a a, you know, a, a confection the city can lay claim to, but it's rather odd to find what look like polo mints sitting in lumps of rock. Um, and this is a, an example from outside St. Michael the Belfry Church. Um, so clearly, even with council budget cuts, they're not likely to start paving streets using waste confectionery products. So what's going on? Um, and actually this allows us to explore all the things that I've mentioned I'm gonna sort of discuss within this evening's uh, talk. So you know, why are these rocks here and what are they? And actually, we can go inside York Minster for an early clue of, of sorts. Uh, and this is part of the St. Cuthbert window. Um, so if, you, if you're in the Minster, I think it's still undergoing conservation work. So it, it's not fully, I don't think it's fully visible presently, but they're actually, as a part of the conservation work, they're explaining a lot about St. Cuthbert, who 
um, various friends who are more uh, informed on such matters regard as the great northern uh, Christian saint, really. Um, now, from my perspective, what's interesting is he's very strongly associated with nature, and many of his miracles are to do with, with sea creatures and, and animals, and, and he was very strongly linked to, um, to, to wild creatures of various kinds. Now, sadly, the St. Cuthbert window doesn't appear to include anything fossiliferous. I have, I've been looking carefully and I haven't found anything yet. But we know that if you were in the Lindisfarne, Northumberland area, that when people found these curious looking structures on the beach, as they do in great numbers, they were attributed to him and they were known as St. Cuthbert's or just Cuddy beads. Um, and, and these are, are incredibly common on the, the, the beaches around Northumberland where, where St. Cuthbert spent a fair amount of his time. So the, the association was made bet with, with him that perhaps these were his rosary beads or you know, some, some sort of uh, geological uh, phenomenon that, was, that he had, a, had a, a, a part in. We don't quite know when this legend begins. This is always a problem with the mythology of paleontology. So almost all British fossils that are that are reasonably common have a, a, a myth associated with them. So if you found a Jurassic oyster with a curvy shape, you may have known it as a devil's toenail. Um, if you find, um, what's a good example? Well, in Whitby, you might find a, a curly shell. I'll show a po uh, photograph on it or image of one in, in, in a while which were known as snake stones and were said where, where uh, St. Hilda of Whitby Abbey had turned all the serpents in North Yorkshire into stone and cast them down on the beach below Whitby Abbey, which is why you would find all these, these curly shells. So there's lots of mythology around fossils because essentially people have been finding them for as long as people have been finding stuff and they've had stories around them. And um, as we'll come on to in a moment, uh, the, the idea of what a fossil is has a very long prehistory. But Cuddy beads, these, these sort of small particles found on Northumberland beaches, were associated with St. Cuthbert without anybody perhaps really understanding what they were, at least until this gentleman comes along. So we're, this, well, I'm going to his entire life history part because I don't know it all, but also because it'll take quite a while. But he's, he's the central figure in my story this evening. Um, and, and Martin Lister his father was from Yorkshire, Sir Martin Lister uh, was, a, was a Yorkshireman, but he himself was, was born in Buckinghamshire. I think it's partly because his father had, had done very well for himself and they kind of moved closer to, to London and, and the, you know, the kind of the main government and, and, and royal circles. Um, so he was born in, in, uh, in Buckinghamshire uh, and then he was educated in Leicestershire uh, and then went to, to St. John's, Cambridge uh, and, and graduated there in, in 1658. And he was becoming a physician, me medical science was, was his, his interest, but it was very strongly associated with natural history. And he's one of these early uh, figures in, in science whose his interests are very diverse. And you, you look at what he wrote about, and he clearly had an enormous array of interests, but they were very strongly linked to the, the natural world, trying to understand, I guess, where, you know, where medicines came from or could come from, how the world worked, um, and it turns out, as I discovered, that, that fossils were one of his real fascination. If you go and look for his biographies online, you'll find, so the Yorkshire Philosophical Society have, have written about him, and, and uh, as we'll mention later, Anna Marie Roos, who's a historian at uh, University of Lincoln, and one of the historians of the Royal Society, she's written extensively about his, his life. And, and he, had, he was the first person to realise that spiders could fly, albeit by ballooning using their, their silk but he, re he realized this. He was an expert on shells um, and he wrote uh, what I call the bumper book of shells, but it was more officially the Historiae Conchiliorum or the history of all shells, um, which again, we'll get a mention of more of later. Um, but fossils play a role throughout his life. And that for me was, was really interesting. And a big part of that is that, so he graduated from Cambridge but the medical training in Britain at the time was not of the best quality. So he went to the continent to improve his understanding and spent three years in Montpellier. And one of the really important things I think for his life was that he met there a gentleman from Denmark called Niels Steenson, who later becomes known Latinized as Steno. 
and is actually, if you're, if you're a geologist like me, he's one of the figures you get told about because he's essentially the father of stratigraphy, the idea of layers of rock and, and sort of how sediment accumulates. And the principles of stratigraphy we still use today hark back to, to Steno, essentially saying in a stack of layered sedimentary rocks, the oldest rocks at the bottom and the youngest rocks at the top. And if you find things cross-cutting, the one that cross cuts above must be younger than the ones below. And it's a lot of the basic kind of observations. But this was a time when the Earth was really not understood to any great extent. And, and so the 17th century is that time where, where knowledge begins to, to, to develop. But there's some very big uh, elements of understanding required to be made. And so there's key figures who do that. And Lister spends time with, with, with Steenson as he was clearly gets influenced by his thinking and when he comes back to, to Cambridge he becomes restless possibly because Cambridge is not actually that geological so, you know, the, the East, <laughs> East, East Anglia is is as my friend Stephen who's coming to stay with me next next week uh, he com he's from he's from northeast Scotland and he complains that the Cambridge there's, there's no hills there's no rocks there's nothing for me to do I, he, he got up to York and was like oh a little bit of topography here this is exciting um, so it's a, it's a curious thing um, but a big part of it was that when Lister married, his, his wife, Hannah Parkinson, her family, like his, were, were from Yorkshire. And actually, her family was still a Yorkshire Dales family. So he was drawn back to, to Yorkshire when, when he married. And they married in York in, in 1669. Um, and, and then he decided to settle here and set up his, his practice as a physician in York, initially just outside Blossom, well, on Blossom Street, just outside Micklegate Bar. And then as he became more successful, moving into town, uh, essentially where St. Helens Square now is in sort of the Stonegate Lendl Junction that has disappeared in the 18th century reconfiguring of York. Um, and he, well, he was clearly a very busy man in, in his medical work, but uh, you also get the sense from the number of letters he's writing that, that he's doing a lot of other things. Um, and it certainly makes me all think of Tempest Anderson here being an ophthalmologist, but who was really a volcanologist. <laughs> and every time that the message got out, he off he went. And I can imagine, <laughs> I imagine patients kind of mid-examination <laughs> being, a volcano's erupted, Mr. Anderson. <laughs> um, and I think, I think Martin Lister probably had an element of that, maybe not quite as dramatically, but, but, but uh, plays into it. And I think York actually plays uh, a a fundamental role in his life in terms of him proving himself as, as a physician and as a, as a scientist, although the term didn't exist yet, um, but also his family life and, and then you know, kind of moving on to eventually to London. And he moves to Westminster in 1683 and eventually becomes physician to Queen Anne. So he did pretty well for himself in that, uh, in that trajectory. But I'm really interested in what was going on in, in, in York and what he was doing uh, in, in York not in a medical fashion but in a in a paleontological fashion and in november last year I, it wasn't a big celebration sadly york doesn't seem to have quite picked up on it but last year was the 350th anniversary of the first paper in paleontology uh, because the royal society which i think it was 1665 the royal society was founded so the newly founded royal society um, is beginning to circulate the latest thinking on anything that its members were thinking about, essentially. You look for the early archives, the Royal Society, it's full of you know, amazingly diverse. I've been thinking about this, with a letter sent in. <laughs> Chapel Henry Oldenburg was the secretary, he was clearly receiving a lot of letters from, from his, his membership. And in November 1673, so yeah, 350 years ago, last autumn, Martin Lister from York wrote to Henry Oldenburg, um, pondering what some features he was finding in the rocks of the Yorkshire Dales really were. And he talks about certain stones, and, and these classic thing, great, great long titles that they have. At the, I suppose because they were writing letters, they weren't writing papers yet. It was, he would write a letter and then it would get read out at the next uh, Royal Society meeting. So this is an image that uh, was, uh, was used to illustrate what Lister was arguing. And this is actually quite an interesting development. And Lister plays a really key role, and again, we'll come back to it, in the illustration of scientific discoveries and the realization that you have to show people very precisely and clearly what it is you are talking about. Words will not do that job fully. You want to be able to show what, what it is you've been seeing. And so he got one of his colleagues in York, uh, I think it was William Lodge, they were part of a group who called themselves the York Virtuosi. Um, they were all pretty young men who, who were keen to kind of make a name for themselves. Lister 
friend Simon, who did the York City History Walks with, says this is probably about the oldest member of that group at the time. So they're, they're quite a young group. Artists, scientists, philosophers, um, all doing interesting things. And, and yeah, William Lodge was one of the uh, people who illustrated Lister's early works. So these are the things that Lister was finding and looking in the rocks of the, the limestones, particularly that you find around the, the Yorkshire Dales. Hannah, his wife, the Parkinson family were from near Skipton, a place called Carlton uh, in, in Craven. And uh, the rocks near their limestones that are full of interesting uh, structures. So Lister was trying to make sense of what these were. So he'd illustrated them and he was then describing and, and trying to, to, to make sense of them. And it's it's also a paper or a letter that you can read now and it's it reads in a relatively modern sense even though it's 350 years old you, you you can read through it and it and in fact martin brazier who came much later was a professor at oxford uh who was really interested in the in the origins of paleontology he argued when it was the 350th anniversary of the royal society that this was the first scientific study of fossils now Da Vinci might argue otherwise, because he, he had done some quite interesting um, studies. But in terms of writing out a paper, almost as, as a student now would be told to write a, a paper, Lister follows that kind of um, approach. And there's some great phrases. Uh, so these, this middle line of images, uh, he's mostly finding quite small things that look like St. Cuthbert's beads. And he calls them, he mentions it. So in the 1670s, we know that name was associated. He says the people uh, in, in other parts of Europe and um, Latinized called these things trochites. But here in England, they're known as St. Cuthbert's beads. So that name is clearly you know, something that people understand. Um, and most of the things he's describing are similar to what I showed you in the palm of the hand. But there are other features with these strange sort of five branching uh, elements to them and they were rude stones of the bigness of walnuts um, but he but he describes as best he can the the morphology the shape that the, the patterns he can see uh, and of course the other thing at the time it's not yet really a time we have microscopes or any you know, means of really examining things closely it does come in but it's 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 very embryonic in its, its development so it's quite you know almost like you picking something on the beach and having a look at it and, and, and describing it um, and his his conclusion is that perhaps these features he is finding in the limestones of the Yorkshire Dales are plants petrified or rock plants. Now, whether that means fossil plants in the way we would now think of it isn't quite clear from what he's writing. Um, we know other members of the Royal Society described features in, in rocks from elsewhere in Britain, elsewhere in the world that, that had a kind of plant-like appearance. Part of the problem, of course, there wasn't yet a, a, a scientific system for really describing these things or classifying things or even interpreting them in, in a very you know, sort of sensible way because you know, the science just hadn't yet really happened. So they would look, as we tell our students to do, study the, study the uh, well, the present is the key to the past. So that's if you're approaching a paleontological problem, get your head around what is living and growing now. And that knowledge will take, take you a good way to making sense of structures you might find in the, in the rocks. But at the time Lister's working, it's quite a, a, a tense period because, of course, if the, these structures he was finding were not like anything he knew of living today. And he describes these as being plant like. And yet the structures you see running through the holes, the center of the, of the features were not like anything he knew of in any living in any living plant. So there's a problem of I've got these rocks that are full of things, but they don't seem to be like, or clearly like anything alive today. That raised the problem that, that if they were fossilized plants or animals, they were things that no longer lived on the earth, which would suggest that they were extinct essentially. And that was a, a religious problem because it would suggest that God was fallible. And so there was a, a, a real tension around interpreting fossils. Oh. There's a plug in. <laughs> Where's the plug? This will be the test. Um, yeah, we don't know where the plug is. It should be plugged in. It does look like it's plugged in. Yeah, it's that 
We aren't getting any sound yet. Okay. Right, I should be unmuted now. Uh, yes, yeah, so he was finding uh, limestones. It's like, I'm, it's like being talked to from, from, from beyond. It's like, uh, <laughs> but yes, yes, exactly. That's it. Live from, yeah, from, from live tonight from Carlton in Craven. It's Martin. Um, yes, yeah, so, so they were finding the, the rocks had these structures in them. And then sometimes you would find them as just isolated uh, items. And he mostly focused on things he was finding around the Yorkshire Dales, but of course he was also making comparisons with what had been described from elsewhere. So he knew that in Northamptonshire, for example, people had found similar looking things. And in fact, I think he describes Bugthorpe as having something of interest in comparison. Now the rocks now we know, Bugthorpe, are much younger than the Yorkshire Dales, but we also know that there are some of these kinds of fossils in the Jurassic rocks that make up the area east of here. So actually he was onto something there. But as I say, the big, challenge really was was what these things were where they were from and, and how that kind of explained the the origins of the earth and life on earth so there was a lot of, a lot of tension um and uh bear with me it's going to come there we go i've also brought with me one of the specimens i sent from 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 whitby this is one of st hilda's snake stones and in fact it's it's essentially the same one that's that's illustrated here this is one of the pictures that was like 1678 drawn for Martin Lister when he was talking about shells. And it's a brilliant drawing of, it, it's perfect. You know, if I show you the specimen I have, it's almost identical. So the 1670s, they're making very uh, precise drawings. But the challenge was, what is a fossil? In the, in the time that we're talking about, a fossil was literally anything that was dug up. The Latin word for a ditch, fossa, probably the origin of the river Foss and many other fosses around, just things that were dug up, ditch-like. Anything you dug out the ground was a fossil. What I now think of as a fossil has a rather more specific meaning, but at his time it was whatever, archaeological material, you know, geological material. So they had this real challenge of saying, well, okay, are these things really the remains of an ancient animal or an ancient plant? Uh, or are they just minerals that happen to look like that? And, and there was a real discussion about whether plastic forces in the earth could perhaps create these sorts of structures. Perhaps the patterns were just coincidences. Um, and this was a, a Royal Society hot topic, essentially. The part of the Royal Society went, no, 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 they are fossils of animals and plants that used to be alive. Others, no, 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 they're just plastic forces. Lister seems to have sat on the fence somewhat. <coughs> I think he could see from his study of the natural world that the similarities were remarkable, but I think equally he was a little cautious about making the statement, particularly things that were no longer on earth, that, that they were the remains of extinct animals. So there was this long running uh, debate. One of his colleagues, uh, Robert Hooke, was particularly keen to argue for these things being the remains of extinct creatures. And this is Hooke's drawing of ammonite fossils. Uh, it actually wasn't published until after he died. So we know the Royal Society discussions, he was very uh, animated about these things being the remains of, of extinct animals. But actually in terms of it being published, it didn't come out really until afterwards. But these drawings, again, are, are stupendously carefully observed. And what he realized, and I guess one of the key things here is, these wiggly lines, when he saw how the shells, they were the suture lines, how the, the shell was growing. And he recognises that each ammonite species, as we now call them, has its own unique suture pattern. Um, he didn't call them that exactly at the time, but, but you know, he was making the observations that underpin a lot of what we, what we now do. But as I say, it was quite heretical to make claims that, that things were, were extinct. And, and, uh, and so the Royal Society was having a lot of, of, of tensions around this. Lister, it's, um, it's difficult when you read his letters, it's difficult to work out exactly what he thought. He was clearly making good observations, he was coming to plausible conclusions. These things he was finding that St Cuthbert's beads were perhaps petrified plants or something like that. But he, he, it's not quite clear, at least in the letters, what, what his opinion was about where, where, they'd, where they'd come from. Um, but say so he, he was obsessed with doing this job as properly as, as he could. And he became increasingly frustrated with his York artist friends because he couldn't rely on them to produce the drawings quickly enough and accurately enough for his liking. So he took it in-house and his daughters, Susanna and Anna, or Susan and Nancy, 
uh, became his illustrators. So from a very young age, probably 11 or 12, he began training them in observation and drawing here in York. Um, and they actually got use, got use of the very first microscopes. So the, the 1670s is a time where, where the first microscopes really start to come into, into use. There's, a, there's a, a version that I think Robert Hooke is involved with and others in the Royal Society. There's a, uh, a Dutch version that, that I think Leuvenhoek, he, he does. They get access to these. And it's clear that the, that the sisters, Susanna and Anna, were actually using microscopes to look really carefully at, at, at specimens. And when Lister publishes the history of all shells, the, the Historia Conchiliorum, they did all the illustrations. There are, I think, about a thousand figures of shells, and Susanna and Anna, as far as we know, did all of them. Um, and they include some of the, the first microscopic work published. And this image on the right is a fossil shell from Maryland in the US. Lister was getting specimens from across the empire and included them in his, in his work. So there's a lot of really interesting, you know, you can think York arguably has the first paper in paleontology list of writing, but actually now the first scientific illustrators, the first microscopists working in, in this sort of field. Uh, and yeah, these remarkable uh, young women who Anna Marie Roos has written extensively about. It's a fascinating book to read about, about their remarkable life. Sadly, of course, when he moves to London and they get a little bit older, they seem to disappear from, from that sort of story. Whilst, whilst they were in his world it was possible once they married and and you know weren't allowed to do that sort of thing anymore we seem to lose track of what they were what they were up to which is very sad but the work they did is, is exceptional and it was all about producing brilliant careful drawings of what what was being seen so anyone around the world could know what you were looking at and that was a really key thing so lister never worked, really worked out what these things were he thought they might be plants they finally become formalized in the 1820s with the name crinoidea and that means lily-shaped, crinoid. Crinus is, is the Greek, crinos is the Greek for lily, and anything oid is like or shaped. So a, a crinoid was a, was a, a lily-like structure. And the chap who was originally from uh, Gdansk, Johann Muller, moved to Bristol, became John Miller, um, and wrote the first sort of thorough description, mostly based on fossils. It was still at that time, only really these fossils were the, 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 the examples of crinoids. But in the 19th century, people had begun to realise that there were living sea creatures that were plant-like, but actually animals. And so the, the idea that they looked like plants, Lister was on the right track, but we now know that it was, it was a trick in a sense, that they look plant-like because they're feeding in a somewhat similar way, but actually they're, they're, they're animals. And Miller and others began to realize they're not entirely extinct. So Lister's problem of this heretical extinction thing wasn't, wasn't quite uh, the, the case. And there's a fantastic link to, to this building and the Anderson family, because here's Constance Anderson, Tempest's sister. She was an expert on uh, archaeology and architecture and, and wrote books on York Minster and, and, uh, and others. But she married a gent called Percy Sladen from Halifax, who was of independent means. And he, in his sort of independent means time, was fascinated with, with crinoids and sea lilies, particularly fossils from the Yorkshire Dales and West Yorkshire, um, but also living ones. And they became a really interesting partnership when they, when they married uh, that, that led to further sort of understanding of, of the group of creatures that we now include uh, crinoids within. Um, and although Percy did not go on the HMS Challenger expeditions uh, in the 1860s and early 1870s. Those voyages that the British Navy sort of facilitated for, for scientific research collected deep sea specimens of all manner of creatures, which included a whole raft of crinoid, living crinoids. Uh, and the key thing really was that the ones that people had found living around the shallow seas today didn't have stems. So one of the things that List was trying to get his head around what all these different parts belong to. Um, when they, the Challenger expedition went out, they started to dredge deep water and they found things that essentially looked very similar to the things that had been described as fossils 100, 200 years earlier. And it seems that all of those stalked crinoids that we were finding so commonly as fossils in, in the rocks of Yorkshire are not found in shallow marine environments any longer, but they have been living in deeper water and that that was a real kind of revelation and Sladen although he mostly interested in starfish he did work on on some of these these groups and the challenge expedition provide, provided lots of material to try and um, to try and make sense of so so what is a crinoid what what Lister's idea they petrify plants well that name the crinoid sort of reflects that 
but they are part of the phylum echinodermata, so the group that includes all spiny skinned, mostly five fold symmetrical creatures starfish, brittle stars, cucumbers, sea cucumbers, um, uh, sea urchins, and these guys. They're kind of the fifth class of the, of the main groups of echinoderms. I'm particularly interested in fossil starfish, that's one of my research interests, but I do periodically dabble with, with the, the crinoids. And the thing I particularly like is their, well, their symmetry is amazing. There's, almost, there's no other animal group that has five-fold symmetry in, in the way they do, but also their regenerative powers is, is one of the things that's really fascinating. And actually, they've been a focus of, of a lot of research in trying to understand how is it that starfish can regrow arms so readily. Some species can lose an arm, Deliberately, they can cast off an arm, and if the arm is not destroyed, the arm can grow a new starfish. That's quite a trick. Um, sea lilies, crinoids can do some of that, and they have regenerative powers as well. Um, and yeah, we know in deep water they are still present. What we think now, we have a very deep geological record of these things going back um, hundreds of millions of years, is that they were incredibly abundant in the Paleozoic era. And that has a nice link to York because John Phillips, the first keeper of uh, the Yorkshire Museum, was the man who defined officially Paleozoic, Mesozoic and Cenozoic as the three eras of life. So crinoids would be part of really the Paleozoic uh, communities and actually the big extinction events <coughs> that mark the end of these eras, they suffer particularly badly. But actually they also suffer badly because a lot of predatory fish we think as they evolved, they became better and better at, at feeding on them. And so the only way to survive was either to become more mobile, lose your stem and be able to swim, or move into deep water. And so we think what happened with the, with the crinoids is that the shallow ones became more, more mobile, basket stars and feather stars that can swim, or they moved out into much deeper water where the predators didn't, didn't come. So the survivors now are in places that the, that the ones Martin Lister found were, were not. They were living in a different, in a different place. So the, the limestones of the Yorkshire Dales are full of them because they were shallow marine tropical limestones and these things were, were a key part of those Paleozoic reefs. So what are they doing in York? Well, there's a strange tale to kind of finish off with, really. Um, so I mentioned the Yorkshire Dales is full of these rocks. That's what Lister was finding. Um, and this image just links kind of why they are here, partly. Um, so if I go out to the Minster and you examine the Roman column, uh, the Roman column itself has been re-erected uh, in Minster Yard. If you are to wander around the base of the column, you'll find lots of cobbles. This is one of them, and it's full of the polo mints. What are they called officially in paleontological terminology and biological terminology? Columnals, because they are the column of the sea lily. So I like to imagine in 1971 when they put it up that there was a there was a you know, person involved with this who had a kind of a bit of a link. It was a Roman column and a sea lily column, <laughs> and they put, put them around the base of the, of the, the column. I don't know if that's the case, but I like that idea. Um, and the reason they are here in York, well, partly because people bring them in you know, from, from, from other locations, but actually in the last ice age, when the glaciers were moving uh, across the Yorkshire Dales and down the Vale of York, they were picking up whatever rocks they moved over. And many glaciers that fed the Vale of York glacier were or developing in the Yorkshire Dales. So they were moving over those limestones. So we find pebbles of crinoidal limestone in the hills of York. Uh, and I proved it recently when my friends were doing an archeological dig at Heslington where the university was, um, was building a new building of some kind. And I said, there'll be fossils here, guarantee it. And after a few minutes of picking through the pebbles, there was a, a crinoidal limestone cobble and that had come from the, from the Dales with the ice. So they're called erratics, they shouldn't be here but the ice brought them here. And that image on the left is, a, is, a, is a, a glacial sort of landscape that might have been something that York would have been like 20,000 years ago. But yes, now you see them on the cobbled streets because they've been used often decoratively, but, but sometimes more structurally. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's sort of the reason they are here is, is partly to do with tropical reefs in the Yorkshire Dales and partly to do with ice and partly to do with people. So it kind of pulls everything together. And um, we can, if you go into York Museum Gardens and the pebble mosaic, you will see the geology of York laid out in pebbles in the garden, but actually the artist Jeanette Ireland made some pebble crinoids. Um, so you can see some sea lilies made of, of pebbles here in the corner of the, of the mosaic, referencing that. Um, and yeah, we can, we can argue that York is the birthplace of, of paleontological science because Lister's paper in 1673 was really the beginning of this approach of, of all we now do setting out that kind of how do you look at fossils and make make sense of them so yeah i didn't know this until a couple of years ago and i'm oh, this, this is great i can now make some bold claims for york's 
paleontological status, even though there aren't really any paleontological degree options or, or courses happening in York presently. Um, as part of the Festival of Ideas this summer, in June, I am going to lead a couple of urban fossil hunts, corals in the cobbles. So if you want to do that sort of thing, keep an eye out for the Festival of Ideas programme, which should go live a couple of weeks time, I think. Um, this is one of the fossil corals, also probably from the Yorkshire Dales, which you find in one of the cobble streets near the Minster. So yeah, if you can keep your eyes peeled and, and have, uh, as I always carry with me, a hand lens, a magnifying glass, and then you can, you can check what it is you're seeing. You probably also want a glass of water because you can make, pour that on the pebbles and then they become much clearer. That, co that coral is much more visible when it's wet. So, um, but yeah, I can show you a lot of different things we could find in the streets of York. That's also feeds into what I mentioned, uh, the York's hidden history stuff. So if you are interested in more, more general kind of walks, I've got a few flyers with me. We generally do elements of your air, air, fire, earth and water. The earth walk is the most geological one. So that's, that's the one if you want to go fossiling properly. Um, but we like to just explore the strange natural history of York, including this, this creature from the, the bestiary that was produced at Holy Trinity Church in the 12th or 13th century of a creature. We have no idea what it was really supposed to be, but it was a banacon was the name for it. Uh, it was a kind of ox-like creature with curly horns. Its main uh, powers was that it could fire dung over a two-acre area, and the dung was fiery. I'm, I'm wondering what creatures they saw that made them come up with it. I think Lister would have had, would have had trouble uh, believing that, but the best is a, a fascinating kind of early idea of natural history in, in, in York. So yeah, we can explore things going quite a long way back. Um, in fact, recently there was a discovery in, I think it was in Cambridgeshire, that the Romans had a specimen of a, of a Jurassic fossil that was being curated in a, in a Roman sense. So yeah, we may take paleontology even further back. Um, talking of Romans, we are, I'm currently involved in a project trying to save Severus Hill. Um, so we're the, on the old reservoir that supplied the city with its water, just outside uh, the city. Um, it's named after Emperor Septimius Severus, who died in York in 211 AD and may have been cremated there. We have no direct evidence that he was, but it's, it's likely he was cremated outside the city on a high bit of ground. So this is why the name has been applied to it. And there's a crowdfunder that's just been launched to try and raise £170,000 to buy off uh, the, the Yorkshire Water agents uh, for as a community green space. So um, yes, if that's something you might like to get behind. And I think there will be fossils of crinoids in the hill because it's because it's an ice age hill. I suspect if we dug into it, we'd find some of Lister's fossils, but we'll see. Um, and yeah, final thing. I also organise the Yorkshire Fossil Festival. So uh, if you want to come to Redcar on the late May bank holiday weekend, we'll have a, a free weekend of fossil fun and there's a kite festival happening at the same time. So on the beach, you can fly your kites and learn how to make kites and that sort of thing. And then we'll be doing lots of fossil and geology activity. So plenty of, you to, plenty of things for you to sign up to, come along to. Um, but yeah, keep your eyes peeled when you're walking the streets of, of York because you might find some of Martin Lister's petrified lilies. Thank you very much. questions what a wonderful talk thank you so much and thank you for bringing attention to Anne Marie Bruce who came from Oxford to speak in York about Martin <coughs> great and he also discovered as you know the um, octagonal tower being Roman by looking at the bricks yes you're right yes so yes that's right Martin Lister was was I think the first person to to argue that yeah York had Roman walls still yeah. preserved in the city. So yes, that's a good point. I hadn't thought into that. Question, please, Liam, and that is the number five. What's so special about it? In Martin Lister's drawing in 1673, you can see that he emphasised the pentagonal nature of many of the specimens, and you also alluded to it later in life. What's special about it, either in biology? Or yeah, so it is a really interesting question. Why is the number? Why, why have echinoderms got this pentagonal it symmetry? Is. It's it's not a common number for, for no. things to, to use, no. but they but they do it. Um, it it's it's an interesting one. I spent a chunk of my PhD trying to make sense of this because I was studying fossil starfish, the vast majority of which have five arms, yes. but some don't. And in starfish, at least, there are two models, and, and it may well be, real, well, I said the number five is related, but the, their, their deviation from five is probably linked to their regenerative 
powers being rewired somewhere in, in early development that means that, that certain five armed forms yes. kind of go off into multi armed forms. Yes. Uh, but why the, the, the group overall have this fivefold symmetry? One of the arguments is that it's the first approximation to radial symmetry. If, if you have fourfold symmetry, you are square, yes. so you're not really very, very radial. But once you add a fifth element to it, if, if you are in some way trying to uh, live an all round life, that, that that's the first sort of number. So that, it's that, not really five, it's 72 degrees. Perhaps, yeah, and this is one of the arguments about, about kind of the angles, were, were they, were they uh, important in this? Now, I guess part of as well is that um, studies have, have shown that many of the echinoderms we know, they're very confusing creatures. They are the closest related invertebrates to us or to, or to vertebrates. So they have sort of bilateral development and then they spin off. Um, Recent genetic studies uh, and, and developmental studies have argued that they don't, they have almost like a colony. So rather than being, the, the, if you look at the way they kind of, the, the, there's, a, there's an interesting paper about starfish, that where, where, how would a starfish wear trousers was the argument they said. Where, where were the real legs on a starfish? Yes. And they looked at development and said, it's kind of all head. And, and so the argument is there are lots of, of worm-like animals almost sort of stuck together. And that they're then behaving as a, as a colony rather than as a as an individual. I mean, there's still lots we don't understand about this, but there's there's a suggestion that it's something to do with the way that they are living uh, as a sort of radial. How, how how do you the starfish argument is that they don't actually have a front or a back. Any one of the arms can be the lead arm, and off they go. Now the crinoids were mostly um, sedentary, so they probably don't quite have that, but. But nonetheless, if they're feeding and they're trying to cover the area equally, being radially arranged is, is a good plan. And actually, five-fold symmetry is the first reasonable approximation to so that 72-degree thing. So, yeah, I find it's a really fascinating question. And, and yeah, I don't have a particularly good answer for it, but I think there are people who are beginning to try and make sense of it. So maybe in 350 years' time, we'll, we'll actually know. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for a very interesting lecture. A lot of the Royal Society early people were based in Wiltshire. There were also there was a lot of uh, uh, early archaeology stuff in the and on the Jurassic Coast. Did, it, did he have any contacts with the Jurassic Coast? Yeah, so, so the question about, about the Royal Society, yeah, as far as I can see, Lister was writing letters right, left and centre across the Royal Society group. And I think particularly he, he wanted to get as big a data set as he could, particularly for shells. He wanted to try and understand shells in whatever sense that, that meant. So yeah, anybody who found something, he would be requesting either an image of it or a specimen sent to him. Um, and, and yes, if you're, if you're in the sort of Wiltshire, Dorset area, there are many interesting geological specimens turning up. But also, yeah, archaeologically, they're beginning to realise. So, for example, there are there are um, Neolithic and other prehistoric graves around Britain where echinoderms are included in the graves. There are crinoid ossicles in a in a, a prehistoric grave in North Yorkshire, which maybe harks to something like the rosary beads that Cuthbert had. That, that perhaps they could be attached to a bit of string, or they were you know they were sort of objects of importance. There are suggestions that some of the sea urchins with a five star impression right in the middle was star stones that there was a kind of connection to the heavens so they were clearly important objects and yeah people finding curious or curiosities um were then being encouraged to send these to, to the royal society and i guess the ashmolean museum kind of developed as a, as a place to try and curate a lot of this material and lister was was involved with that and i guess ultimately here in york with the yorkshire museum that kind of spins out of the, what we need a, a, a repository for all of these things that you're discussing so we can come and, and, and check it. And uh, yeah, I think that the, those, those letters pinging backwards and forwards were, were a key part of, of trying to connect and make sense of, of what, what was out there. Sending letters was quite expensive at that time, so you must have been charging <laughs> Yes, we should, we should check, the, <laughs> check the records of yeah, how much it was, yeah, what the stamps. Right, okay. you're muted, yes. Well, okay. Robert, if you won't, just tell him he can answer. Yeah, go on, do you want to answer a uh, question from Zoom? Yeah, you can unmute himself. Yes, if you have a Zoom question you want to unmute yourself, please do. We'll work out where the button is. Let me check out the 
Robert, you need to unmute yourself, in which case, touch the top and you'll find you, you can unmute yourself from that. Can I? I don't think you can do it. No. Okay. No. We've put it in the chat. Maybe that's the, maybe that's the next thing. We'll check. We've got a question in, in the chat. So, da, 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 yeah. No. I can say I, I, I don't think I've not seen anything that he goes that that far and, and it was I think it was a real challenge to 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 sort of to put a, a number on that. So yes, Archbishop Busher in Armagh comes up with the age of the earth, but I think it's the 27th of October, 4004 BC. Wow. That, is his, that was his, and it was, I mean, to be fair, it was quite a scientific, you try to take all the ages of people in the Bible and say, this is how old the earth is. I, I've got a degree of understanding of saying, okay, it's wrong, but you had a clear explanation of how you've done it. So, you know, if you tell your students, you know, that, that's, that's a perfectly a valid approach, even if you come up with the wrong answer. Uh, I don't get a clear sense of the Royal Society of, of them engaging with, with this exact sort of debate, or at least in, in, in a specific number, because it was so hard to, how would you, how would you do it? It's not really until John Phillips and, and the 19th century sort of the, um, that York actually plays a key role in this, that there's arguments between the Minster and the Philosophical Society about the age of the earth, because Phillips, despite being very devoutly uh, Christian, did not accept that age of the earth. It couldn't work. So it was a question of, well, how old is the earth? And he and Darwin argued about Darwin thought it was older than Phillips did, and Phillips was arguing on the basis of how fast sediment would accumulate. But I don't know if Lister ever really put that down. Um, Hook was probably more of a likely candidate to have done that, but again, I don't know that he ever explicitly gave a, an age for the Earth. But it's it's certainly something that must have been debated, even if it's not recorded. Um, so. Wow, it's not really a question, but we're watching Martin Coombs is doing a series on the islands. And that was earlier this week. And um, he was in Papua New Guinea. And they have, who look so similar to those who have those beans, but just slightly prominent, slightly lighter, lighter. And they used to, on the islands, they, they had strings on them, and when you had a certain length on them, that was the a certain amount of length. Mm. Yes, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure that kind of idea of these these things as, as a currency of sorts must have also been must have happened in, in, in they're so abundant in the UK that the, the idea that they never had some some sort of value in that way is it seems unlikely. But I don't know, again, any direct e equivalent. But yes, yeah, it's, it's a good point. I'll try and read out. No, OK, <laughs> grand. He says, have you seen the cunoids in the Milford Sounds, New Zealand, South Island? I haven't, no. I, I had a friend who I did my PhD with who she was able to, to uh, arrange a trip. We, there were three of us doing PhDs all on sort of um, Silurian reef fossils um, and they're all from Dudley in the West Midlands, so not, not the most exciting sort of scene location. I actually have an enormous soft spot for Dudley because it's just got these amazing fossils. But yes, you probably don't send people there for the glamour. And my friend Joe spent time in New Zealand and my friend Rosie spent time in Australia. I never got any further than, than Denmark. So um, I've never, never, never made that kind of comparison. But yeah, I would imagine there's plenty of, of interesting marine settings that you could go in. And in fact, Rosie would be my go to because she was the crinoid specialist among us. So um, I have to sort of defer to her. Um, but she now works for some important police organisation and she's not had to tell it anything that she does, so yeah, I can't get hold of her. <laughs> you talked about um, not being allowed to use the word extinction perhaps heretically. I thought the Inquisition and burning of the state had finished a hundred years before that. Yes, it's probably, it's probably a rather uh, yeah, I, I guess it's more, it's more the kind of the, the tensions that, that play out in terms of, um, of how you're your interpretation of the geological record goes up against accepted wisdom. So I think within the Royal Society, it's more that, that you, you have, or you seem to get these sort of factions between uh, different different members who uh, don't don't want to be, um, I guess, yeah, can, well, they all want to go against accepted wisdom, but there's a sort of point where some are keener to make it fit the existing sort of biblical narrative or, 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 
Christian narrative, others are happier to go a little bit off in other directions. And the, I guess the idea is, yeah, the, the age of the earth, who's it, Archbishop Usher, it's around the same time, it's the 1660s, this kind of how old is the earth's coming in and, and that, this sort of debate between what, how literally you take biblical information and, and then how challenging your geological information becomes that yes i think heresy is probably a bit a bit a bit far but certainly it was it was seen as a, a tension amongst some of the yeah i think and it, it, again it's interesting you see even going into the 19th century that quite a lot of the physicians play a, a key role in a lot of the early paleontology and then uh, victorian or even georgian uh, vicars and, and priests play key roles and it's interesting seeing how those as, as the idea of the age of the earth starts to get more developed the tensions play out even further that actually probably becomes more of a problem in the 19th century when when people go well we've now got so much information that, that this idea of Russia's 6,000 year earth just can't work and and there's a number of cases where people get almost well they have mental breakdowns essentially because all the things that they've accepted structurally they've been told uh, uh, kind of, well, this, but this doesn't work with what I'm seeing I think at Lister's time it was still new enough that you could probably avoid some of that but there were certainly from from what I've from what Anna Marie and others have talked about there's this kind of tension plays out between those who are trying to adhere more strongly to a particular existing um structure and others who are going off in a more free form <laughs> route. Okay. one more question at the back you describe Lister's daughters as having drawn uh, the illustrations for their father's letters using a microscope. Has anyone compared the letters <coughs> who keeps these letters uh, in their uh, with the things that were produced? Because the obverse uh, of the print <coughs> was made, and how accurate? Yes, that's a good question. Yes, so yeah, have the, the prints from the drawings. Yes, um, again, I mean, Anna Marie Roos has, has looked into the the work of the Lister sisters and, and and trying to yeah get a sense of can we connect the specimens that they were looking at with the drawings that they've that they've done, and I think in some cases she's been able to show this is definitely that specimen that you know, is in the Ashmolean or wherever the, you know, where the collections were, and. Yes, kind of comparing the, the detail. I don't know how systematically people have tried to go through that, because I say there's a heck of a lot of, of specimens that, particularly in his book of shells, is an enormous number. But many of them, I think, still are I'm in. Thinking more of the letter, the drawings of the letters. And yeah, the I... pictures that were produced from the drawing from the letters rather than the original. Yeah, I, 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 could, I, don't, I don't know for, for sure what, what's, how, how kind of close they are. And I guess there's also the thing with it, depending on the, the two different microscopes, the, the, the sort of British one was more like a hand lens, so it didn't give enormous magnification. The, the, the Dutch one I think was giving a greater magnification, but it was very focused. So I think they probably didn't use the microscopes enormously often to do the kind of drawings. It would have been mostly a, a kind of a comparison from... Um, but I think, I think Anna-Marie has argued that you can look at their work over time and it gets more and more precise that the early drawings are, that the, at least the earliest ones we know of, are a little cruder and then they get more 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 impressive as they as they develop which i guess you'd, you know, you'd expect but um yeah so it's a good question of whether the whether it matches up well and i don't i don't know um, if that's been looked into properly thank you i'm going to ask for the vote of thanks uh, by John, uh, John Reed, our only existing member of the board. May I echo the, the, the comments of how what a fantastic talk it's been. Uh, uh, I think that to, to present a, a history of uh, local fossils to a whole load of largely medical fossils here. <laughs> as relation, I have to say that I never really realised how much there was available to see around here. And I certainly will um, look around with different eyes in, in future because I think that there obviously is an awful lot of history here. I think it's also interesting. Uh, talking about Martin Lister and commenting on um, Tempest Anderson and his sister here is um, how they were able to do this and yet practice as doctors at the time. 
I'm not sure how the NHS would uh, <laughs> do these days, but yet that sort of polymath uh, must still exist, but um, maybe stifled in people these days. Um, I also reflect on the fact that this building was around when Martin Lister was here in the uh, Amazing that we are privileged to be in this sort of building, hearing about work that um, was going on in its early days. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank you uh, for an excellent talk that I really enjoyed. I'm sure they all say that and give you a vote of thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you. There are a few, a few fossils that you can have a, have a closer look at if you want to see some of the things that Actually, you've found. one more question, just um, before I talk about next time, is um, the Stegosaurus. Oh yes, uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really pick this up yet. Uh, we, <laughs> I, was leading, I lead fossil hunts periodically and I was on the coast at Whitby a couple of weeks ago and there had been a recent landslip uh, beneath the Abbey, so I mentioned St Hilda. Um, most of the fossils people go looking for there are the ammonites, but the upper layers of the cliffs beneath Whitby Abbey are, uh, are middle Jurassic in age, a little bit uh, younger than, than the main Whitby rocks. And rather than having marine fossils in them, they have um, coastal fossils, terrestrial fossils in them, which can include dinosaur footprints. And when we were looking through the recent landslip beneath the Abbey, we, we were saying, I reckon there'll be some dinosaur footprints in some of these blocks if we look carefully enough. I had a family group who had a certain amount of patience, but it was lunchtime and they wanted to go and do something else, understandably. They found fossils, that was fine. Of course, within about 10 minutes of them leaving, I found a big chunk of sandstone which had dinosaur footprints in it. Um, and there's two of them which I took photographs of, and I'm going to go back next week and see if I can get proper images of them if they're still there, which we think are probably impressions of the hind feet of stegosaurs. Um, now, they're not stegosaurus because stegosaurus is, is really an American dinosaur and it's from the end of the Jurassic period but we think they are footprints of an earlier relative of, of, the, of the group of stegosaurs that was roaming Yorkshire about 170 million years ago so um, yeah if we can get back and get those images it's easy when you can see them in, in 3D when it's flat they're, they're a little harder but they, there's two with three toes so you can see the toes and then the kind of the heel impression um, and the Yorkshire coast has about 30 different kinds of dinosaur footprints. Um, some of them are on display in the Yorkshire Museum, so if you, you know, have a look, you can get an idea. But, but yeah, if you find a, a landslip anywhere on the coast where there is middle Jurassic rock forming part of the, of the cliff, there's a fair chance. And, and I say to people, most times if I take you out and I know where we're going, we will find them. So they're, they're actually... Yeah. So that's my Christmas present. So exactly, yeah. So, yeah. I'm not sure how we'll get the stegosaur block off the beach, but, but you know. Um. And uh, for tours and things, uh, a couple of fossils sitting at the back might get Christmas presents from your oh. tours. <laughs>